Welcome to the Thrive TV Show with Lauren Parsons, helping you boost your health, energy, and productivity. Hi there, and welcome to the Thrive TV Show. I'm Lauren Parsons, your host, and today I'm joined by Cal Middleton. Welcome, Cal. Hello, New Zealand. Thank you for having me on. Great to have you with us all the way from Missouri in the States. So Cal is a world-renowned horseman, author, and behavioral specialist, and today we're talking about horses and life learning and teaching. So we're going to cover off the positive aspects of keeping an open mind, how understanding the correct philosophy of working with horses can improve all of our lives, and how to use direction, not correction. So I'm looking forward to this, Cal. Before we get into that, let's just go through our this and that questions with you so we can get to know you. So tell us, would you choose spots or stripes? I would have to say stripes. Stripes, okay, nice. Singing or dancing? Singing. Ah, cool. Logical or creative? Logical. Hmm. Would you rather be lost on a mountain or on a deserted island? I would say probably a mountain. Yeah, probably a mountain. Wish you probably wish there were horses there. Uh, yeah. Broccoli or carrots? Ah, uh, carrots, please. Okay. Cardio or weights? I would say weights. Okay. Would you rather play 10 different instruments beautifully or speak 10 languages fluently? Mm, that's a tough one. I think languages would probably do me a little more good, but you can do a lot with music too. Mm -hmm. Nice. And charades or Scrabble? Probably charades. Charades, act it out. Nice. Okay. So a lifelong student, Cal has been working, has been a working cowboy, world champion horse trainer, professional judge, and has also worked in public and private schools specializing in children with behavioral needs. Cal learned from some of the top cowboys and horse trainers and horsemen in the world, including Peter Campbell, who learned from the legendary Tom Durant's inspiration from the original Horse Whisperer title. So Cal now travels throughout the world conducting horsemanship clinics and provides, provides customized horse training. He's the author of Cal Middleton on Horses and Life and the host of his own podcast, the Horses and Life podcast. So Cal, tell us a bit about what you do now and what you love so much about it. You know, there's a lot of things that I really love about what I do and uh, I, I feel lucky that I get to do something that I love for sure. But I, I really enjoy traveling and getting to know a lot of new people everywhere I go and getting a chance to help different people with different types of horses all over the world and different places. And I spend a lot of time in the United States, of course, but I've gotten to travel a few other places as well. And uh, it's just really neat trying to help people wherever they are and being able to go to their neighborhood and see if I can help them uh, with some of their horse issues. And what is it you'd say that sets you apart from other people that work with horses and do horsemanship? You know, I think there's a lot of good people out there and good horsemen, horsewomen that have a lot to offer. Um, if there's something that kind of sets me apart, I, I feel like right now it seems to be that I'm always searching for knowledge and, and trying to gain more all the time. Uh, there's been a lot of people that I've done business with over the years that kind of get a little bit of, um, they get a little bit of success, they get a little bit working for them and then they kind of seem to plateau and stop there. And I've just never quite been uh, content with uh, my level of knowledge and want to learn more. And every time I learn something new, I want to pass that on to everybody else. Fantastic. So tell us, you mentioned that there are so many positive aspects of keeping an open mind. Why is it you say that? Sure, I think, uh, uh, you know, so many things that can really benefit us in this world, whether, whether we're working with horses or animals or children or whatever, or just other people that we work with or family members. I think keeping things open to where we don't get too close-minded or judgmental to where we kind of feel like we have things figured out or we know the answers and and that, uh, you know, we know how people are supposed to act or how the horse is supposed to act. But I think when we're, when we're open to whatever might come about, I think, uh, you know, that can really do people a lot of good. Just just kind of going with the flow at times. And, and there are boundaries and there are parameters that we have to learn to stay within. And there are, there are set things and, and kind of logical rules that we can follow. But on the other hand, just staying open and, and uh, open for more knowledge, especially more evidence and, you know, more, uh, just more good things that might come about. And so you talk about the life application of spending time working with horses as being beneficial in our general life. So for listeners that are listening in, 
Can you explain why it's so helpful working with horses and how it applies to our lives? You know, I think anybody who who is focused a lot on, on doing one thing specifically, whether it's horses or whether it's, uh, you know, working with sports or, or athletes or children, different things. There are so many different things that you can apply whatever you do to life. And I think it's just, you know, it seems to be that for me, the working with horses uh, is what I do. So I can apply that to different aspects of life pretty easily. But I think whatever people do that they focus on, that they're passionate about, I think the key is to help people understand how that can apply to their life. And on the other hand, how their day-to-day -day life can apply to the horses or to whatever it is that they're doing. There's a lot of relationship back and forth that doesn't really go one way. Um, I think there's just a lot of things, kind of like we just discussed, being open-minded and, and kind of just thinking thinking first about kind of what that horse is going through and, and what that horse might be thinking rather than just trying to impose our will upon the horse. Um, a lot of times we can kind of say, you know, uh, there's a lot of specific disciplines that happen in horsemanship or in horse training. People think, I want to get this horse to go do this event or get the horse to go do this specific trick or sport. But sometimes we have to just stop and think, you know, this is just a horse. And he doesn't, he or she doesn't really know anything about that specific discipline that the human might want for that horse. But we have to first just look at it as a horse. And I think doing the same thing with people, you know, rather than looking at this type of person or that type of person, just first noticing that they're humans and they have the same basic needs and wants and that we all have. And so we have to start from that. Fantastic. It's really interesting that I'm speaking to you today because just three days ago I spent a whole day doing a workshop around horsemanship and it was specifically around looking at our communication styles and how we interact with the horses and it was so eye-opening for me and okay. especially that I've done a lot of work around communication styles. I was looking at the four personality profiles but it was really interesting seeing it revealed in this new way and not only the classroom work we did, but especially when we got to work with the horses and trying to get them to back up and trying to encourage them to walk and then to trot and then to stop. These simple things, but once we got going, a lot of the people that were there with me couldn't get the horses to necessarily do them or do them quickly or some, in some cases do them at all. And so it was interesting seeing the interaction and seeing sometimes when we're being submissive what that creates in other people or in other animals and, and if we're being too dominant or too telling rather than asking. And so they've focused all around trust and respect. And I think that's got so much transparency to leadership roles, to parenting, to relationships, to every other area of our lives. What are the key yes. things that you teach? Yes, I, I, I couldn't agree more. That, that communication in general is just, it's such a big word, but it's such a vague word, you know. Uh, how we communicate to a horse well there's so many different things that we do and uh, there are there are different types of communication that may be more important or less important depending on what the horse is going through that day or depending on even what the human might be going through that day and it is uh, very interesting to to also work with different types of horses or different horses and you realize that this type of communication doesn't work as well for that horse as it does this other horse and then you kind of switch back and forth now, all that being said, we do take all the different horses into consideration, all the different types of personalities. Um, there are times when a horse is very interested in what we're doing and he feels safe and he's curious. And there are times when something's going on and he may not feel very safe and curious. He may be a little more on guard or, or a little more defensive. So at that time, it's a different type of communication that might be needed. And a lot of kind of what you just said, you asked me what, what I spend a lot of time teaching. A lot of what I teach is basically trying to help the horse just feel better on the inside and in the process we do the things that teach the horse how to give us control of their feet or in other words give us control of them their body their mind in a way um, but we have to do that in a way that gets the horse to feel safe and I've spent a lot of time doing um, what a lot of people might call some of the more advanced things and the upper level competitions and reining and cow horse and cutting and worked on some ranches and done some of those types of things but at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what type of discipline that we're looking for. The first thing we have to do is make sure that we are safe around a horse because we all know horses can be dangerous. Well, the first thing we need to do for us to be safe with a horse is to get the horse to feel safe. And that's kind of where things have to start. And then if we, if we take that philosophy onward and as we move towards asking the horse to do more and more and more, then the horse is going to do more for us if he always feels safe when he's with us. So the more we get that horse to feel safe with everything we're doing, the way we ask it to go forward, the way we ask it to 
lope, the way we ask it to stop, the way we ask it to turn. If we do all that in a way that makes sense to the horse and keeps the horse in a balanced frame of mind and physically balanced, then the more of that we can do and, and the horse can try a lot harder for us and we can rely on that horse a lot more because she or he can rely on us. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. You talked about the correct philosophy of working with horses. Can you just, for people that are listening in, can you just give us a definition or give us, you know, the succinct, what does that mean? What is the correct philosophy? Well, the, the correct philosophy is obviously a, a, a term that, that can be very, very debated and, and uh, very argumentative. Um, the way that I look at it, the correct philosophy, and, and one of the guys I learned from that, that we discussed, Peter Campbell, something that he said quite often was there are thousands of ways to work a horse, but there's only one right way or one correct way. And that is from where the horse is at. So mm -hmm. we start out from the horse's point of view and we start out from where the horse is mentally and where it is physically. And we start from there and go forward. So there's no, there's no one specific way as far as, you know, Cal Middleton's way or anybody else's way it's more of the horse's way so instead of saying okay well this guy says this and this person says that and that lady says that so let's have a vote and, and then let's figure out what the correct philosophy is instead we let the horse be the judge we let the horse decide the horse gets to vote and we say to the horse in a way you know hey does this work for you or, or are you here or are you there and a lot of times you see people that are trying to get their horse to work at, at this high level when in reality their horse is at this lower level and mm -hmm. A lot of times it works the opposite effect also. A lot of times people are trying to get their horse uh, to do something uh, foundational or to do something uh, at the very basic level when in reality their horse has done that, he's okay with that, she understands that, so it's time to move on. And if you don't move on when the horse is ready, then a lot of times you never can really gain. So mm -hmm. it's, it's understanding where your horse is, is, is what I would call the correct philosophy. So then it comes comes into, okay, well, who is it that can speak for the horse? Because obviously the horses can't really tell us where they are. And I'm not here to say that I can understand all the horses, what they're saying and thinking or anything like that at all. But what I'm trying to do is help people understand how to read their horses, help people understand how to get the most out of their horses and help people understand how to get horses to feel better on the inside. So then we can get more from them on the outside. Mm -hmm. This is great, Callum. Just, I'm thinking about this as an analogy for and, the, and as an application for leadership and business, you know, for leaders that want to get the best out of their team, being able to start where their team member is at, making sure that they understand, they're looking at it from their point of view, that they're giving them enough challenge, that they're moving forward and progressing, that they're not feeling overwhelmed, neither feeling bored in their role. And, and I can see how working with horses and doing this can lead directly into that. You know, it's so many things, leadership, parenting, relationships, so many yeah. areas of life. Yes, for sure. I, I, I agree. Um, it is so many areas of life. And, and before we even get to that leadership as adults and that career building or anything like that, we have to start out in the schools. And I think a lot of those things that, you know, in the school, some of the work I've done in the school systems, um, I see a lot of that that's that's missing and it's it's difficult. You know, there's a lot of teachers out there really trying hard doing a great job Just like any career in any industry There are people that do a good job and there are people that don't do as good a job The system itself has some good things about it and I know different countries are always a little different But there's also some pieces of the system that I hope Someday we can improve upon and a lot of that is exactly that, you know, trying to um, Work with each child from where they are, you know, rather than just you know treating the entire grade or the entire class even just as one group and and they do everything the same and what what ends up happening is we focus on the middle and we lose the ones at the top and the ones at the bottom you know the ones at the bottom tend to fall off the ones at the top they tend to either work back to the bottom or work back to the middle or they end up falling off the top and we just kind of keep moving this middle uh forward and that's uh that seems to be something that we're uh, we're struggling with all the time that's mm, really interesting. It reminds me of Sean Aker's TED Talk where he talks about how researchers, when they get given a question like, how do we improve people's performance? They look at, yeah, how do we improve average performance rather than what is it that makes these standout individuals perform at a high level and how can we extend them? But, I mean, that's the whole education sector and system is probably, we could go on for hours about that. I know you mentioned that you teach people how to use direction and not correction. Can you tell us about that? Sure. So there's something that I talk about a lot in my clinics whenever people come and have a group of horses there that I'm, that I'm working with is not to get caught, caught up in terminology. And there's a lot of times when, you know, you can write something down and, and 
you know, somebody can use the word direction and they mean this and somebody else can use the word correction and they mean kind of the same thing. But the phrase direction, not correction is not something that I made up. It's something that I've, I've kind of been taught and, and it's been repeated numerous times by some other great horsemen that I learned from. But the idea is that we want to always help the horse know what it's supposed to be doing rather than just trying to punish it for what it already did that we didn't like, or maybe what it's doing that we didn't like or that we don't like currently. And there's a lot of times when a horse is searching for some direction or they're searching for some attention and they're trying to figure out what it is that they're supposed to do. You know, horses don't really have the ability to be dishonest. They don't really have the ability to lie. They don't really have the ability to try to cheat someone or uh, very rarely are they trying to, to do anything to a person. They're usually trying to just figure out what it is that they're supposed to do. They're, they're trying to get along. They're just that type of animal. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are the same way. And so what we have to do is, is try to figure out how to help that horse know what it's supposed to be doing rather than just always saying, hey, you're not supposed to be doing that. You're not supposed to be doing that. So the, the correction, the word correction, the way that I use it here for this, for this way of thinking is more like a punishment, meaning after the fact. And so the direction that we're looking for happens before or during the action and the correction happens after the action. So what we're trying to always remember is that we need direction earlier rather than correction when it's too late. Um, mm -hmm. For example, there's a lady that, you know, maybe has a horse and it kind of goes up and bites her on the arm and she says, well, what do I do after my horse bites me? And I say, well, it, it doesn't really matter. And they say, well, what do you mean? It doesn't matter. I don't, I don't want it to keep biting me. And I say, well, if you don't want it to keep biting you, then you've got to get there before it bites you. But after it bites you, it's too late. Anything you do after a horse bites you is correction or punishment. And that never works. It doesn't really do any good. Yeah, so instead, what we want to work on is direction, which is as the horse is looking over to think about walking up to you, then maybe you tell it to step over here or step over there or step back over there. And in the beginning, it just may be a little bit of a thing where you can learn the timing and learn to, to kind of get your horse to do something you want rather than something you don't want. And you're kind of just blocking it from doing what you don't want. But as time goes on, what you're doing is you're teaching the horse the coping mechanism of, hey, I'm just going to do this on my own rather than go over there and do that, which is what I'm thinking I'm needing for the attention or for some kind of idea. So it's the same with the children that I work with a lot in the, in the school districts. A yes. lot of what we're trying to do is just trying to get, uh, you know, trying to get there earlier. And uh, instead of waiting until we have this big issue, we go ahead and tell, help the child learn what it's supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. I think that's so powerful. And I'm glad that you linked that into, you know, working with children, let's say parenting again, or even motivating team members. It's so much more powerful to uh, set a clear vision or set a clear goal and explain what it is that you want done and then be able to praise to that goal and reinforce the positive rather than, as you say, having to follow up and correct and then restart over. It's, it's always such a better strategy and technique, isn't it, to be able to praise to the positive, set a clear direction, and then and not necessarily prescribe how it's done in certain situations, especially in leadership, you know, but explain what the end goal, the end vision is, and then praise as people head towards it, and correct perhaps as you need to, but... If we can minimize that, we have much better and more effective working relationships, don't we? So yes. have you got any great stories or examples or, you know, favorite stories or anecdotes from working with horses that perhaps illustrate some of these things, Cal? You know, there's there's so many good stories out there. Um, and a lot of the stories that I, that I get to tell are stories that I was there uh, to be a part of. And there's also stories that I might have heard from somebody else that they were there to be a part of it. And, uh, you know, those are those are always kind of uh, kind of powerful things. And there's a story that I heard once that I'll, I'll pass on. Um, it's not really my story, but, but it's uh, not really the sure. point of it. But the idea is that there was a, there was a lady that was having trouble uh, putting a bridle on a horse. And so my friend Peter was learning from uh, his friend Tom Dorrance at the time. This is the story that, that Peter had told me. So Peter was a young man. He was learning from Tom and he was wanting to teach people and wanting to help people. And and he saw this lady that was trying to put this bridle on the horse and she was having a lot of trouble. She had the horse tied up to the fence. She was doing everything wrong, quote unquote wrong, you know, that, that uh, Tom had been teaching Peter how to do it and looked like it wasn't going to work very well. And so Peter kept kind of saying to, to Tom, Hey, I want to go help that lady. And Tom kind of said, no, I don't, I don't think she's. And Peter was like, well, I don't know, I don't know why I wouldn't go over and help her. And so he, he started to go again and Tom said, no, I'll just wait here. So then the, the, he, the lady was doing this and it was upside down and having trouble. And the, the lady kept having more trouble, more trouble. And finally, Peter kept saying, Tom, I want to go help her. And, and Tom had said back to Peter, 
Oh, why would she listen? You know, and Peter kept getting frustrated. And finally the lady tried to put the bridle in the horse's mouth. The horse kind of reared up and jumped forward and kind of smashed, didn't, didn't injure her, but kind of smashed her up against the fence. And she kind of got a little banged up and she kind of finally looked over and put her hands on her hips. And about that time, Tom elbows Peter and says, Hey, now's the time. So wow. what he was doing with, with Peter was the same thing that we try to do with the horses. You can't give them direction at the wrong time when they're not ready for it. You have to wait until things are kind of in the right spot. And it's the direction, not the correction. So sometimes the correction can happen early when the person or the horse isn't really in the frame of mind to take it. And so that's not going to work either. So what he did was obviously nobody wants to see anybody get hurt, but he had to wait until the lady was realizing the outcome of what she was doing wasn't going to work rather than way before she even realized there was going to be a bad outcome. Somebody tries to go over there and give her some advice that she wasn't really ready for or wasn't asking for. But as soon as she has trouble, then all of a sudden she realizes what she's doing is not working. Now you kind of go over and say, hey, here's something that might work a little bit better. And the same thing that, that Tom might have been doing to, to Peter is the same thing that, that Peter would do to the horse. And of course, same thing Peter did with me. And, and there's a lot of stories I can, I can go into there. But, uh, you know, there's, there's just the idea of trying to make sure that the timing is is important of when we offer direction and when we don't you know we've all been a part of a conversation whether it's just friends or family or even if it is a teacher student role or mentor type of role a lot of times where there's people giving advice that was never asked for mm -hmm. or there's people that are kind of butting in and telling people you should do this or you should do that or you should sell that truck or you should buy this horse or you should get rid of that saddle rather than saying things like you know you could do this or you could do that sometimes we just offer we offer ideas and we offer, you know, some guidance or some help rather than trying to put things in there that haven't really been asked for yet. So whenever the lady had a little trouble with the bride, it's kind of like, hey, she's kind of openly saying now, hey, now I need some help because what I was, what I did, I, I took it to the extent and it didn't work. Yeah, it's fantastic. And I think it reminds me of as a coach, we can never try and coach someone that's not willing and ready to be coached. And like you say, timing can be everything. Obviously, there are other things that go with that, the way that your message is delivered, but people need, first of all, to be receptive, don't they? Yes. Fantastic, Cal. So I know that you do travel around a lot to do your clinics and to work with people with their horses. Have you considered coming over to New Zealand? And is there a way that people could connect with you if they are from New Zealand? Yes, I would. Uh, I've never been to New Zealand. I'd love to go uh, that direction. I'd love to go to New Zealand sometime. Um, you know, basically all it takes to get me to go somewhere is to try to try to get somebody who's willing to put in a little bit of work and say, you know, we have an arena here and I can do some work to get some more people involved. And, and then, uh, you know, they get a few people signed up. We, we, we find a date for a clinic. We find an arena where we can do a clinic at, uh, whether it's a little ranch where there's a lot of horses or whether it's just a public place and we just get some people that would come in. Uh, and then uh, somebody just says, hey, I'm going to take the responsibility and organize this and we get it done. And then they call me up and say, you know, hey, how can we do this? So the first thing to do is just reach out, send me an email. Uh, you know, it's all on my website, which I think will people can find at calmiddleton.com. It'll be there. And so, yeah, they can they can look me up there and then we'll we'll find a date. And I'd love to come over and see you guys over there. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Yeah, and if you're just listening to this as a podcast, make sure you head to thrivetvshow.com where you can find the show notes and all the bonus content. And down below, we'll have the links. So the links to your website, also, if people want to reach out to you or get your book, that's available on your website as well, Cal? Yes, yes. My book is on my website. I think it's on Amazon too. Uh, I'll hold it up for you guys that are watching. Uh, Cal Middleton on Horses and Life. And it's uh, with me and my friend Vernon Rowe. And uh, mm. Dr. Vernon Rowe is uh, on the back here. There's a little picture of him, a little bio about him. Uh, he's, uh, he's one of the top neurologists in the world. And uh, he helped me put a few things in there. We talked a little bit about how the brain kind of works and how some other things work and he's a he's a great author as well had some books out before and kind of mentored me in my first book a little bit and uh really excited to get it out there dr Rowe was also the first guest on my podcast which came out back in january of this year if you guys get a chance to check that out mm -hmm. fantastic so i was going to say you head over and check out the name of your podcast again is horses and life podcast Horses and Life podcast with Cal Middleton. So check that out as well. Well, thank you so much, Cal. If there's one final piece of advice that you would share with listeners, whether they've worked with horses a lot before in their lives or not, what's one final piece of advice you'd like to share? I'd say just uh, do your best to let the horse be the judge and don't forget to have fun. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining me, Cal. It's been a pleasure to connect with you and I do hope you come to New Zealand one day and let us know when that is. So thank you so much to everyone that's watching. That's been another episode of The Thrive TV Show. Go out and thrive. Thank you for listening to The Thrive TV Show with Lauren Parsons. Visit thrivetvshow.com to access the show notes and discover our fantastic bonus content. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next inspiring episode.